uh, the bush would not much good unless it's burned. But today, the bush is overgrown. It's overgrown with uh, that much rubbish. Fire is a hot topic. The fact that our First Nations people altered the whole ecosystem and landscape of Australia with continual burning is well documented. Millions of dollars have been spent on inquiries into our great wildfires as to their cause and effect. We could have asked the Aborigines, especially the ones up north in Australia, where the practice is still carried out. Or we could have asked some of our local old timers, which I did. You don't see many wildflowers in the bush these days, not to, as to what you, you saw those days, because those days being open and more burnt, burnt more, burning the bush, you've got to, uh, to get wildflower, it's got to be pruned. The same as a rose tree. If you don't prune a rose tree, you don't get flowers. Well, the same thing applies to the bush. You know, I remember as a kid, saying the coast needs burning every third year. It was just native pasture, rough pasture. So they would just set a light to it on a, on a day, say a windy day in the end of March or something like that, and just let it burn. They would not go along if it got near the fence, they'd put it out. There wasn't very much, uh, what to call, flammable material in it. It was just short grass and fern. We know that the early squatters on the coast employed local Aboriginal stockmen, so it's almost certain that they carried on the burning habits of the Aborigines to promote new growth. Uh, it is necessary to have light burns to, have your, to bring your wildflowers and also to germinate your tree seedlings. And uh, they jumped down on that and would not permit any burning with the result that you have a build-up of dead vegetation. Uh, that thick that in many places you can't tear your way through it. And uh, they have, have uh, created one huge fire hazard that eventually will burn and cause the destruction of a lot of your tree seedlings. The, the bush in the first operations that I had in this bush was very open. It, it, in those days, well, well prior to those days, they used to have a run here known as Halloran's Run. And I think if you search the, the bush in one or two places, you would still find the remains of an old fence. It was fenced, the runs were fenced those days. And the bush was very open. They used to graze it, you see. And uh, a lot of native grass or, you know, silver grass and a lot of bush grass. Early management of the forest was very piecemeal. It was not until a forest commission was formed in 1920 that structured management of the forest took place. One of these moves was to ban the traditional habit of frequent cool burns. This had been carried out by the Aborigines for thousands of years and was followed on by European graziers and bullock teamsters. The graziers then had to be very careful not to be caught lighting fires. It's about as far back as I can remember, but they had 2,200 acres at Lyons, 10 miles away. And uh, the day he could see when he got out of bed that the day was right, for a fire and the wind was in the right direction. Got on his favourite horse, General, 72 hands high, and uh, rode up the 10 miles and he was just lighting up and he spotted a grey horse, a chap on a grey horse, and he knew who that was, it was the ranger. So he swung the horse around, galloped through the bush, jumped the slip rails onto the Highway, Hayward, Mount Gambier Highway, jumped the slip rails into Dingo Dell, galloped home through the bush, rounded up two horses, put them in a wagonette and took a load of fat lambs to a sale in Hayward and cashed them out. And the reason for that being that he had an alibi? Yes, yes, but uh, there, was no, there were no questions asked. No, he, he was just too fast for that fellow on the fat old grey horse. <laughs> Tim Hodgetts was a very experienced man. 
that Tim's policy was before the summer every year to go through the forest and burn all the treetops that trees that had been fallen, burn the tops and he would burn up any build up of dead vegetation anywhere in the burn he burned it and because he never permitted it to get dense he always got a light fire and we never had the fire risk that we have today yeah when i was a young fella sort of eight nine year old used to come out in the forest with dad um, cutting posts and splitting logs and the forestry fella used to come out and stamp the tree for us and as he was walking away he used to use a fire lighter and just spread the fire all the way back to his car and we'd be working all day with the fire just creeping around the bush around us never really affected us that much unless you had stood on it for too long got hot feet but yeah it used to just trickle around through the forest finger little fingers going out and about no real big flames or anything like that of course it was uh after the log hauling of the bullock teams and horse teams it was burnt every autumn for and then the sheep um, marina weathers used to be running it every in the different runs so they had about three from Grictrick to the coast down to uh, Mount Richmond way the one out in front was or out from Lyons was run by the uh, Molsids, Emersons and Kerrs at uh, Winnip Drictrick, much more open chasing kangaroos and the sheep feeding in it. Um, Yakka would, young Yakka and Heath Country would um, come up after the burning and that was what the sheep would feed on. In uh, my younger days, uh, one of my occupations was sort of roaming through the forest looking for wildflowers and orchids. And um, it's the thing that uh, annoys me today, I might say, that in those days there was an abundance of orchids in the way of spider orchids, sun orchids, hyacinth orchids, green hoods, they were everywhere. Also, there was a mass of the red and the pink heath that, that existed everywhere and it was quite a picture to see but as time went on and the control of the forest changed from the Forest Commission to the National Parks uh, those orchids and those wildflowers are no longer in existence due to the way they manage the forest in actual fact. A mile and a half away was the jackhouse crossing and the big tree ferns grew there and uh, there was a hut there, it was there all my life and a long time before. Jack Doyle uh, lived there and, and attended the, the sheep that the Emersons ran there. And, um, but then the, after restrictions came in, instead of uh, patches being burnt out, no fires at all, a big fire came and burnt 20,000 acres, including, including uh, the tree ferns and the hut at Jackhouse Crossing. Burnt the Good Hill out and the Mount Deception. And there hadn't been a fire there whilst we owned Mount Deception. But it was all burned out because the restrictions came in and instead of fellows like my father dropping a match here and there and keeping it under control, uh, authority said no. Well, they got the big fire, and the only thing, only reason it didn't burn to the sea was because the, the weather changed and came in a bit damp. And it'll happen again. When I was a young fellow, well, teenager or uh, seven or eight or ten, when we'd ride through the bush, you, you could gallop through there. You'd, you would, you'd hard, you wouldn't get a hard to get a draft horse through it now, let alone a pony. But uh, that was through it used to be being burnt. In the 1960s we, we got a letter from the Soil Conservation Authority um, because we, we didn't have a fence between our property and the lake and also the cattle used to go out around Maltese Lake and um, feed through there. And um, 
Uh, we got a letter from the Soil Conservation Authority saying that we must remove all stock from the area which is National Park now. Coast wattle is not a noxious weed, but it's an invasive weed. Uh, when you take away the uh, natural predator for, um, for coast wattle, which is either fire or stock, uh, it just goes rampant. And um, in these areas that um, are around that are now uh, full of coast wattle, it's, it's also a, a fire hazard. One day there'll be enormous fire in some of these areas here and it will burn as hot as hot. They managed the forest. They really managed and farmed the forest correctly. It all sounds lovely, and no doubt it was. But to go back to the old ways would not be easy. The fire officers have many constraints put on them today. It is a whole other subject. I don't envy them their jobs.